here uh, uh, at sea. So I'll just kind of uh, give a background to our, uh, our uh, 11th cycle of the Sea City Conversations. Uh, basically, we just finished uh, a whole uh, cycle of uh, uh, five years of architecture school of the school uh, last year, last month, la month before last. And uh, so, therefore, we also finished the whole cycle of CCD conversations where we have hosted uh, technically about uh, 75 to 80 uh, talks uh, which happen fortnightly at, at this place, uh, but informally more than 100 uh, talks where we have called a range of people, a uh, range of cultural practitioners, intellectuals, uh, um, architects uh, and other kinds of uh, um, uh, people working in the larger domain of culture to talk to the city. The, so these events are completely public. They are absolutely uh, free of uh, charge uh, and anyone is uh, free to step in. And so we are also trying to kind of create a uh, a kind of a cultural space or a forum for discussion of cultural and intellectual issues in the city, in the northern part of the city as opposed to the south because a lot of times we see, we, uh, we find that people uh, have to, for any kind of cultural engagement, people have to go to complete uh, uh, southern part of the city uh, and uh, often we are not able to travel so far and so we do not kind of end up going to a lot of these uh, um, uh, events. And so uh, our uh, our um, uh, endeavor has been to kind of create C as a space, as a kind of uh, counter space in that sense, uh, geographically, uh, uh, to be be that space where people can come. And we have been seeing that uh, we find a lot of students and uh, 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 locals coming from uh, nearby, uh, all the way from Virat Vanderi, and uh, we have uh, and that's very encouraging to find. So we hope that uh, that process will continue continue uh, and grow. Today uh, uh, we have a very uh, interesting uh, 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 speaker, uh, an artist with us uh, and uh, 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 Vishwa Shroff. Uh, her practice is uh, primarily uh, drawing and uh, she creates these very um, uh, intricate and delicate kind of works which fall in the intersection of architecture and art and we'll see in, uh, in uh, uh, her works how she kind of uh, articulates uh, this kind of uh, uh, liminal boundary. Uh, I'll just simply kind of uh, uh, give a brief background to her and quickly call Vishwa on stage to talk about her works. Uh, Vishwa Shroff started her artist training at the MSU Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda. Uh, and then later she went on to uh, uh, continue her education at the Birmingham Institute of Art in uh, uh, Art and Design in UK in 2003. Uh, and um, her career so far has seen uh, several solo exhibitions of her work, uh, 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 some of which uh, to kind of count would be uh, drawn spaces and postulating premises at the Turkart Gallery, uh, which happen, happened in 2016 and 2015 respectively. Uh, then there were also uh, uh, one eye, two eyes, three eyes in 2012 at the Acme Project, uh, Project Space in London, uh, Memories of a Known Place in 2012 in Birmingham, UK, uh, and a Room Collaborative Book Show um, in 2011 in Varodra, Varodra India. Uh, and besides uh, participating in artist residencies all over the world, uh, Shroff has also been a part of uh, group exhibitions um, such as Again and Yet Again in 2017 at the Gallery OED in Cochi, uh, Cochin uh, uh, and uh, Planes of Experience, Zones of Action in 2017 at the Gotha Institute, Max Muller Bhavan. Uh, and, uh, several other spaces nationally and internationally. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, now invite Vishwa to kind of talk about her practice uh, and uh, then we can probably open up the conversation with her uh, later. Welcome Vishwa. And my apologies for my 4 foot 11 inches that kind of get obstructed by the screen. So I will try and not hide. Um, <laughs> kind of. uh, so also thank you. Um, thank you Rupali for inviting me over. It's uh, overwhelming. 
to say the least. And to see like so many of you is a bit nerve wracking. So I'm going to try my best to do this as smoothly as I can. But uh, in case I flum fumble, I'm sorry. And we'll keep the question answers to the end. But if there is something that you must ask, please stop me and ask that anyway. So I'm going to start with this set of images. Um, this was a series of works that I did back in 2015-16. Um, the thing that I'm, I think, most interested in, as far as my work is concerned, is to like start where most of you end. That is to kind of say what happens to buildings when architects kind of are done with it. Like what happens to them once they start getting occupied and once people start living in them. And I'm kind of looking at how architecture gathers markings of hues of kind of history, so to speak in its materiality, it kind of gets embedded into the materiality of the building and that's kind of what I'm interested in. The other thing that I'm very interested in is drawings and I've been looking at drawing methods that architects and others have employed in history. So there is a point at which it kind of gets fixated to what we know most right now which is this kind of plan elevation, axonometric, but there was a time before in the, especially in the 18th and the 19th century where it's just a whirlwind and people don't have a fixed idea of how to draw yet and so they're experimenting with these styles of drawing and they're kind of dismantling perspectives, um, layering, like doing all sorts of fun things. So I'm kind of, I've been looking at those methods of drawing and seeing how I can employ them into my own practice. So this series of work I call them perspectives. Um, they are not necessarily perspectives, but it's kind of using the word perspective rather loosely as ways of looking at things. Um, and there are spaces that I've actually been to or have been interested in or are extremely famous houses that I've dismantled like a book so that if they open up in various ways. So I think the first one is uh, B.B. Doshi's house in Baroda for his daughter. It is Manisha Doshi's house, which she happens to be a dear friend and her husband happens to be my professor. So it was kind of nice to go and putter around in his house and be a little bit nosy about things. The second one is Third one is uh, Highgate, I think, which is in London. The idea here was just to literally see how I could draw them by opening them up. So that's the details of these works. All the work is drawing with wherever I kind of really feel that color is required, then it has watercolors. So it's on paper, watercolor, ink. Um, I don't tend to use too many mediums, I don't tend to use too many other materials, so... Um, and then in 2013, um, after a long whirlwind around the world thing, uh, I got married and I moved to Japan. And in Japan was very very strange for me because uh, especially in the beginning because I don't speak the language and I kind of was in this very very beautiful neighborhood but at the same time I didn't know anybody so nobody was inviting me to their house and they have these windows which you know like like Bombay in a way where you kind of stand in another building and you can see through their windows and they use also like Bombay use their windows as storage space um, and so you could um, so, sorry if you can't hear me. So, what was I saying? So they use their windows as storage space, much like they do in Bombay and other Indian cities. And I would always stand outside these windows as I was walking around and kind of peep, like be a real dirty peeping tom. Um, so I kind of started to look at. Ooh, ooh, ooh. these 
kind of windows and what you could immediately see through them and kind of wonder who lived there and you know in my head I would make up these narratives uh, my favorite ones were that I would assume what kind of person lives there so not just who lives there but like the personalities they might have so that it, you know when I would see somebody with a lot of white shirts hanging there I'd be like office wala you know and be very very smug about this and then when my husband came home I would tell him all about these stupid stories that I'd made up and he would kind of just roll his eyes and be like yeah okay thank good you had a good day um, so I started looking at kind of making these works which narrate the story of what goes on behind these windows without actually having anything that actually goes behind them because you know beyond this I'm not able to see anything I don't know who lives there I've never been inside this house um, but what I can do is play guessing games using using objects um, and at one point I started to get also really 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 worried about what if somebody opens their windows and looks back at me because then I don't know how to react and I was like oh god that would make me like this really dirty filthy little warrior um, so this actually this, this series of work was called warrior it was impossible to photograph this work without somebody actually holding it so sorry there you get to see some extra bits um, but the work um, was finally installed so there are also watercolor drawings that are cut out. They are about, they're a little bit smaller than the actual window size. Um, and the idea was to install them against a mirror so that you could actually not look at this window without looking at yourself. So it was kind of going, addressing that voyeur in, in all of us who looks at, but also addressing the window as this extreme threshold between what, you know, you don't quite know which side of it you are on. So again, very difficult to photograph work since it was, um, so that's my friend Charlie Levine that you get to see there and I think um, that was like, that's the only way I could actually photograph them is sideways. So going back. And then the other thing that I've been really, really interested in is, uh, you know, how the city also, like the, the buildings in the city also start to change and morph and you use them as landmarks and then so suddenly they disappear. So like I would say something like uh, if, if I was giving him directions and if he and I had a common friend, I would be like, you know, Pratap More ke ghar se left le lena. And suddenly Pratap More is left and his building is gone and it's broken and you don't quite know how to tell him how where where to go anymore. Um, especially in our context where road names change all the time and for the most part I don't know any names of roads in Bombay except Chhatrapati Shivaji Mark. But um, so I kind of started looking at how cities and city um, bylaws deal with these half broken or buildings that are taken away from each other especially in the older city where you know the building uh, share walls and then one of half of it is kind of taken away but you kind of still have this half where you see a little bit of what was remaining of the building that's been taken away and then kind of imagining not what is physically just here but also what is missing what's been kind of taken away and the narratives that might have lived within those so it's an ongoing series uh, this one is from London all the buildings here are from London um, they, the London bylaw states that they need to protect the walls using black tarp and uh, like plywood type patties. So what happens when they do that, it, it, it kind of almost becomes like a Zarina Hashmi. I, I don't know if anybody knows Zarina Hashmi's work, but it kind of becomes like a superbly life-size massive Zarina Hashmi because it's uh, these massive buildings with these beautiful black tops on them. Um, and then, as I said, I'd moved to Tokyo, and so I started looking at buildings in Tokyo and what happens there. And then the year after that, I spent a lot of time traveling. So this is actually work from last year. 
and the first one is from Baroda, the second one is from London, the third one is from Ho Chi Minh, and the last one is from Rome. I've just seen this wall again, it's still there. Yeah. So it's kind of tracing these, let me see if this one will go into some detail. Um, so it's kind of tracing, you know, where these buildings have been broken out. So I'm kind of interested in these moments these very subtle moments that you that are left behind on the buildings right um, in the same spirit of things i'm also interested in how materiality changes within the building so what you know how any any building like this one here has these amazing floor, floor markings everywhere things are broken tiles are chipped and I'm interested in all of them because I think that they kind of tell the story of the building they kind of make you think about what might have been the reasons for those moments to happen or who might have lived here or what kind of furniture might have been here in order for that that discoloration or crack to appear so again, sorry, this is not a very great image, but um, this is the floors of the Victoria Albert Museum Sculpture Gallery. They are very, very tiny works. Um, I will show you a, another image that will give you the details of these ones, but it's basically, while I was drawing this, I started to also think about how we navigate space. Um, how do we walk through a space and what do we see? So because when you walk through you kind of don't You know do that you kind of look a little bit here and a little bit there you look down you look up You look at the person who's coming at you. So what is the kind of attention with which we navigate spaces? And what are those kind of at least for me in that moment? What were the kind of catch points? in this navigation and how does how does one draw this distortion that happens when you are actually walking while looking at something so this is a single corridor so all the works are actually of one single corridor and the little bits that you can see from the corner of your eye that open into another room then again this series of work is from london um, there's a beautiful street called Doughty Street uh, where Charles Dickens used to live at some point. There's a Dickens Museum, also very nice. If you're ever going, please go. Um, and the street, it's a, it's a Georgian terrace, you know, nothing really to write home about. Except that the porches are all different. And they're different because they've been altered over time. And they've been altered over time depending on fashion, depending on material, depending on how much the owners wanted to spend, what they liked. So it kind of talks about history, but it talks about taste, it talks about, it kind of has this timeline within which it's been altered. And so, um, here I kind of imagine myself waiting while I ring the doorbell because again it's that moment where you kind of look up and look down at the same time you kind of look a little bit sideways you know if they take time more time to open the door you may even look at your watch look at the floor again so it's that moment when you're just waiting for somebody to open the door and um, looking at the floor pattern so that's what I'm trying to emulate with this perspective plan, isometric, everything kind of thrown in together. I'm going to show you a few more in terms of details. So these are uh, also watercolor and watercolor medium on paper. Um, it's like I said, it's a single, single street and it had 64 buildings and I think I so far gotten around to drawing 9, 10, and 6, 12 more, so about 20 some. Right. Um, and then this one is actually, I'm working on this, the larger part of this one. This is actually a sample of a work that I'm now working on. It's uh, Camden Town Hall's floor. So Camden Town Hall, which is the municipal building, was going to go into refurbishment. And I got the opportunity to go and document it just about two months before they demolished this floor. So this floor doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I was also, again, interested in 
you know not just drawing the floor pattern and kind of how this beautiful floor just exists but also what time has done to it in terms of the cracks that have happened and it's a marble floor so it doesn't have very many very dramatic cracks like mosaics end up having but it's still uh, still a kind of timeline of this building and then the other thing that i'm kind of interested in is how drawings can work as installations like what how can you just use drawings to you know make make them appear as objects in spite of the fact that they're actually not objects they're just drawings of objects and how these objects in themselves start to tell stories like can i tell a story of me or you or anybody in this room without actually ever meeting you can i you know can i make those assessments based on the things you have the things you collect things you own so this was a project called no time to rest and it was simply just testing the grounds for drawing kind of testing how drawing changes as you walk around it because it's just paper with drawing suspended in the room so when you walk around it distorts itself um, the ants in that are uh, polymer clay ants and then these are the few projects that i um so that one these are projects that are these are maquettes for projects that i have never really installed in in the life size scale that i would like to do someday um this one i it, i do not remember the title even anymore but it kind of looks at again these objects and windows and these imagined spaces and it looks at how objects can tell narratives and believe me i've actually seen somebody have a stuffed full size taxi dummy bear in their house it's not you know it's not kind of making up a narrative you uh, the this one i have an interesting story for this one it's called data at factory and um, this was a long time ago when i was actually dating and my friend and i had gone to the factory earlier that day because he wanted some shipping pallets and then he came back in the night and he was making some sort of furniture out of these shipping pallets and so he had made these really incredible paper models scale models of the shipping pallets and he put these two figurines in front of that and he kind of sent it to me on the phone saying date at factory and i thought that's amazing and then i forgot about it for a long time until i made this one i think in 2014 and it's again this relationship of windows and these large warehouse windows that you see and one wonders what happens behind them what goes behind them this one is a is a market that i actually ended up installing um the only one that i've actually installed from this series it's called 1i 2i 3i Uh, and it's me walking down a single street for a period of one month and documenting what of the street my eye is repeatedly drawing attention to and then that was the ooh, ooh, that was the installation so it's again all the objects are slightly smaller than actual size objects their drawings suspended in in the room this is maybe the way to do it yeah this uh, was in birmingham it's a project called uh, memories of a known city so i studied in birmingham in 2003 and then didn't go back for 9 years um and 9 years later when i went back i was very 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 confused about the city i wasn't sure what of the city i remembered what of the city was new what was it that i thought i you know i thought it was there and that i'd seen it before but was actually new or what of it was actually new but i i thought i'd seen it before so it was this kind of complete chaos in my head as to what's going on i mean have i seen this before have i not seen this before how do i navigate the city that i already know but i haven't been here in a long time um you know and what does one do with it 
Yes, um, the floor is my college's beautiful, beautiful floor, which was, you know, a repeated memory because I spent so much time on this floor. And then again, going back, I kept going to college to meet my professors, and so it was kind of a constant. And again, did the same exercise as 1i, 2i, 3i, where I was tracing what is and what isn't part of my Birmingham. This is an installation that I did extremely recently in March this year. Um, this project is called Distillery Shed as recorded on 6th October or something like this. I don't remember the exact date. But um, this was a, this building is a distillery, it's an industrial building, it's a distillery shed in Baroda which is about approximately about a hundred years old and they're converting this space into a museum and here, here you know for the first time I also started to question you know I'd been thinking about drawings in this kind of object way but I started to think about whether drawings can also fake history and whether drawings can act as false falsified documents of a history of a building that you know the history didn't exist but the building did so if there is no records of drawings of these buildings can I fake them like can I actually make up a narrative for this building which may or may not be true so that's the detail of that work the two walls are as they are currently in their current state and the floor is an assumed floor pattern which then I also decided to give the floor a little bit of that so this is uh, oil pastel on directly drawn on the floor with epoxy on top to give this building a history that it may or may not have had kind of also thinking about the way in which archaeologists deal with renovation and restoration projects and or like people doing restoration of older buildings how they deal with it when you only find things in patches and because I love all of this and this now is what I've done since 2008 with my collaborative partner and husband Boto who is here by the way so if you have any questions for him um, the first book we did so we collaborate on books and um, this was out of sheer excitement it was kind of oh let's make a book and what should the book be about well we don't really have the content so let's make a book about the book so what is the book about so we kind of you know that was a kind of thought process and we decided that for us the book signified a very isolating activity when you read the book it's you and the book and no one else but can a book become a collective activity? Can a book be something you can share with someone else at the same time as you are reading it? And so we came up with this one where, you know, multiple people can read the book. And the idea is that the binding is left open and you can keep adding. Like you can keep adding more layers to this. Um, the second one, it, it was in tandem with another show. This is again from 2009-10, that kind of time frame. It's a very simple flip book. Nothing much to say about that. This one uh, is a book called The Pigeon Detective, The Pigeon Coop. Uh, the Other Pigeon Detective, The Pigeon Coop. This one... Uh, I was very interested in the time, at, again, in this kind of idea of how history is actually a very, very biased narrative. So how a same story that I tell and, you know, if you tell, it will be slightly different. So that I may go into, like, if I'm describing this room, I will describe you know how the upside down table was doing something but you may not describe that you may describe something else you kind of go into these um, so that while we are talking about our encounter with each other it will still be a completely different story and that's what I was exploring with this and also the structure of the book reflects that so that you can do a comparative reading 
and we were worried that this time that you know what if somebody wants to read this book at the airport because it's very tedious to have it open like this and then kind of try and juggle it so the format folds back so that you can also read them one at a time or together but then this book is where it, I, I call this the game changer as far as our book making collaboration or for that matter any other collaboration goes um, this one it's called Room we made it in 2011 it's a very tiny book it's 4 feet uh, 4 inches by 5 inches so it's kind of postcard size it's about 1 inch thick and it carves out this space of a single room that exists kind of on its own in a kind of random random imaginary space the story is that of a girl who you never see um, and her objects are the only thing that tell you what's going on so there are I don't know it's not a clear image but there are these kind of tiny tiny images that keep changing and the building gets sectioned from roof to rafters one mm at a time as you flip the pages and as she grows up or whatever is going on with the story this one is called postulating premises this one we made in 2015 for this one i was interested in again like this was the time when i was thickly into looking at windows uh, looking at what happens behind them and I decided that this was my moment to just give them the rooms that they don't have like until then they only had these objects but can I give them rooms now can I imagine start imagining what kind of spaces there might be behind each window and at the same time my partner was interested in what happens to domestic spaces when they get altered or repurposed for not necessarily the ideal family so in case they get repurposed for completely different reasons such as becoming a kindergarten or an old age home but what happens even if it's not a perfect family like what what happens if one member of the family is unwell or if there is you know some other like it's a single mother this that the other so we were kind of exploring that and so that's that's this book in in its book format i don't know if possible no not possible um, but then we thought it's also dealing with kind of point perspective we started to wonder about what happens if we actually dismantle the book format and put it out like one of those old children's theatres, like Victorian toy theatres. And what we ended up getting was these spaces. So each page of the book is basically one inch apart or less than one inch apart on a, on a stand. And that's also, there, there are 12, 12 panels in the book, 12 such panels in the book. Then we were invited to do a theater set for a play called Gaza Taj, which is written by Rajiv Joseph. Beautiful, beautiful play about these two guys who they are guards. Taj Mahal is going to open tomorrow morning for the very first time. Shaja hasn't seen it yet, and so these guards are not allowed to look at the Taj Mahal so nobody's allowed to look at it just yet because the king hasn't seen it but this is a conversation about the night before the story starts with a conversation the night before and they are wondering whether they should break the law and see the Taj Mahal or not and it progresses to a point where one of them is killed anyway so we started to consider what the Taj Mahal, like how, what the Taj Mahal is all about and started looking at Shah Jahanama, at, at the Taj Mahal complex itself and what we found is that everything, everything in the Taj Mahal is mirrored, whether it's the architecture itself, whether it's the entire site, whether it's the patterns, everything is mirrored. So we proposed a set, this was at G5A in Parel or Lower Parel, I'm not sure, uh, but it, it 
and so it's a it's a beautiful black box so we could do what we wanted with it we didn't you know we didn't have to do a everybody sits on one side like we didn't have to do this um and so we had the audience on the two sides two stages some audience in the middle and the stage the audience actually moved as the two acts went from one stage to the other so it's act one act two act three act four and then act five uses both the stages the red signified everything earthly the white signified everything heavenly as it does at the Taj Mahal um, this is the only image that we are officially allowed to use from this play so unfortunately that's all we've got but I decided to make drawings for it so this is act one and two alternating on stages white and stages red and then three and four and then five so it's five act play and this is something that we are currently working on uh, we've been invited to Jeffrey Museum which is a museum of the home so in the time in the time that my husband and I have known each other obviously you know we are involved in this domestic life as well but that apart we've generally been interested in domesticity as a topic and we also run a project a fellowship where we invite artists to come and talk about you know work with us on the ideas of the domestic but nonetheless that's our kitchen at home and we thought it was rather fun to have this strange kitchen in the middle of our house which everybody gathered around and then what we've proposed to Jeffrey Museum is to bring that kind of semblance of the kitchen to a public space in an outdoor garden where we have these kitchens that allow everybody to gather, gather around, maybe eat, drink, do something with it. So that's it for now. That's all for us. Put this down just to, yeah. It was nice, nice height of it. <laughs> yeah, so if you have any questions, um, anything to say about it, please feel free. Anything to ask me or ask Koto as well? By hand. So it was a one off piece or uh, so it was mass produced? We made. 11 plus 5 I think it's, it's a, the books we make are limited edition because we hand bind hand cut do everything ourselves so room book we made 11 plus 5 uh, postulating premises is only 10 we've decided that every book we make from postulating premises onwards is going to be only 10 because we died when we made those 11 plus 5 books uh, the first three books there are only five of them right so uh, are they hand drawn or are they printed so they are hand drawn scanned color corrected and unprinted thank you hello um, you just uh, in the start you mentioned about there are there were some con different ways in which the drawings and the spaces were recorded before yes. before the conventional uh, typology of drawing spaces in oh. was started and you also said that uh, that heritage like uh, like spaces in the city how you navigate it kind of changes fast like city changes fast in its own self so have you gone ahead and tried different ways in which you can you kind of document navigation in the city because it's going to be changing every moment and it's very interesting to mark those things 
so i mean what i'm actually interested in is how like what is the attention with which we catch these changes more than actually how it's physically you know record the change itself because yeah, I think a lot of people are recording the changes. Um, I kind of will be a little bit to fish out of water there because I also, as an artist, don't have the recording methodologies and I could come up with one. But it, to me, what is more interesting is literally how we, as, in, as an individual, how one immediately catches these changes that are happening. And it's my kind of fantasy that I will repeatedly do the same street a few times and hopefully that becomes a record of how it's changed but consciously as a methodology I'm not using that um, as for your first question yes there are many many uh, I can give you a few examples at the end if you want like Johnson architect is one uh, there is like these crazy crazy archives that are available even online there's one drawing matters which is a somewhere in devon based art gallery that collects architecture drawings from the past there is the C city museum in paris which also has archives of everything until the modernists so there's like all these archives that you can access which have which records drawings of architects in the 18th and 19th century but I mean even all your Bauhaus and all of that is having so much fun with drawing you know which sometimes when I see them now it feels like where is the fun you know why are these people not having as much fun anymore so I mean, including Bauhaus everybody is having fun with how they draw more than what they draw like they a lot of them didn't even draw to build they kind of drew to drew so Every time you visit a new place, uh, I have two questions. So, how do you start thinking about the space in a new city? And does your method of documenting or drawing what you see change according to the city you visit? Um, to answer your first question first, how do I see cities? Is um, I believe that my method of seeing doesn't change much I, I don't think so because it changes as I change it doesn't change as the city changes so a lot of people in recent times have told me that my work has started to look Japanese because I live in Japan but I don't feel it because my own absorption of my circumstances is rather slow so I'm not sure if over a period of time the work is changing because I am changing or because I've changed the city. I mean, I'm not sure about that. Um, but I, I like to believe that it's because I'm changing, uh, not so much because my circumstances are changing. So can you repeat your second question? Um. Does the so the method of you documenting a city does it change from city to city? No, it doesn't. Like I said, it's still like uh, uh, the amazing thing about being an artist is you can be very self-obsessed. So it's very much about putting myself in that observational as the observational apparatus and kind of saying this is how I observe which like I said may change as I change Mishra could you tell us a little bit about your process of arriving at the final kind of drawing like we saw only the finished work now but what kind of process do you go through oh so here it is that's my process. Um, I'm very kind of sketchbook, sketchbook dependent artist. In fact, I kind of like this format so much that sometimes I find it difficult to draw outside of this format. Um, I basically go and photograph 
as I walk, I photograph because I'm also not that artist, you know, that fantastic artist who likes to sit outside and do things. I like to sit in my comfortable studio and do things. So I go out, I photograph, I photograph in multiple ways. Um, everything on my iPhone, I don't own a fancy camera. I cannot handle a fancy camera. Um, on the iPhone, I kind of come back to my studio, look at those photographs again, and then I start drawing in my sketchbook or on graph sheets or on axonometric sheets or on plane sheets that sometimes like especially the last six or eight months I'm finding this very small so I'm kind of having fun with slightly larger sheets um, I then trace them once that drawing is final and it's it needs to be in for me it needs to be final final so it while it may start out in that kind of way, it needs to reach this point before I go outside my sketch. sketch do you board. use a scale? Sorry? Do you use a scale? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Yes, I use I use all sorts of tools. I use scale, I use compass, I use French curves, I even use a drafting table which you know I have very nicely inherited, so it's um, I do not draw freehand much. Um, I love feeling like an architect. <laughs> but like how do you <laughs> how do you keep yourself one step away from being an architect? because I don't know how architects do things I am not trained to be one so no matter how hard I try I will never be an architect no I mean I, I pose that question in the background that architects technically do not really build we also primarily are engaged in the process of drawing just that we and I don't know if you uh, are familiar with the conventions of architectural drawing uh, because every line in architecture drawing means something so if you're drawing a dark line it means something if you're drawing a light line it means something so, so I don't know if you walk through those conventions so those conventions even exist in fine art right a darker line we, we kind of tend to take a little bit more freedom and say well the dark line could be a thick wall it could be or it could also mean like a barrier that you know you can give it more interpretation I love that mental process of how you can tweak things what stops me from being an architect is a I'm not interested in building new buildings I'm not like I, I I'm not I do not also have that sculptural format which is why I don't work with sculpture even let alone architecture like let alone handling an architecture scale the other thing is I'm terrible incredibly terrible at mathematics so everything I draw and everything you see none of it is to scale everything is to visual scale and it's my visual scale which means that it is clearly like somewhere distorted because it takes into account first of all my vantage which is lower than like most average people kind of thinking about something else and looking somewhere else and you know be a bit LLTT about things and then that kind of starts to reflect and I enjoy that a lot more than kind of saying oh let me calculate this and see if it's the right thing like I like the fact that things get distorted because of the way our eye behaves. Um, Vishwak, first of all, thanks so much for this really, really beautiful work. Um, I, I just also think that uh, this process of working with drawing particularly as a kind of, not only as a skillful process, but as a way of thinking, uh, is really beautiful and particularly I'm just going to come back to this say your, you know the last comment that you made where you said you're not an architect and there's no intervention but that one particular place where you know you were intervening I think it came closest to an architectural intervention when you had the floor at the edge um, and it came from this idea of the fictitious drawing you know yes and I find that really interesting because drawings themselves are fictitious to begin yes. with right they don't they're not kind of records or anything but they're kind of particularly architectural drawings they're imaginations of something that isn't there but I think what is interesting is that you take that one step ahead and almost insert this kind of fake memory into the place you know so in some ways it becomes a slightly different 
uh, way of looking at an architectural intervention uh, which is not kind of creating another utopian future for a place but in kind of very surreptitiously you know inserting this this thing which you don't know whether it's a memory or it's future or what you know so i think it's a it's kind of interesting architectural process uh, and i'm wondering whether you want to talk a little bit more about that or you know does it come in any of the uh, any other works that you've done so far so firstly thank you for the amazing compliments it's overwhelming i um, yes i did think of everything that you said uh, but i think what is what for that particular project was most important to me and it's the first time that i've tried to do this where i you know while i've tried it in the in terms of imagining what lies behind something and kind of dealing with my own accessibility to my own curiosity so it's like you know what does rupali's house look like i really want to know this but if you don't invite me i can still make it up you know um it's that kind of curious business that i was working with before this point um for my upcoming show i have i'm i have started to think about it in terms of what happens if i actually start to use the drawing as a kind of in between document between something that is the future or the past and you're quite unclear about where this document or where this drawing actually is meant to go and then also it, it's while i've done you know with uh memories of a known city had done the floor pattern at that point in time it was still very much an exercise of recording observation and i think for the first time with this project i started to draw or in this installation format to give the building an additional layer to its own history because hopefully they don't break it and if they don't break it then in another 100 years it's kind of suddenly changed its own place from what it is right now as well and i think this is the first time i've thought about it and i'm trying to bring those in into my next like this year's work like this is really new it's it's done in march so yeah. i'll be really interested to see where that work goes next so i'm i'm showing at park in january so please come <laughs> In fact, like this this morning, I did some experiments with little fragments of tiles which had failed, and then I, this, just this morning, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a ceramist to figure out how to actually get them like materially right. Hmm. So, I would really like your artistic opinion on the process of restoration of an architectural build form. So, your like. like how i see restoration compared to art is when a build form is restored uh, it sort of loses its authenticity and when i say authenticity because uh, when the initial build form was uh, constructed it responds to a certain context of time the spaces the functions everything respond to a certain context of time but when the build form is sort of restored i mean it loses the build form loses its authenticity like maybe similar comparing it to art when the mechanical reproduction of art the art form loses its aura so i would really like to see the process of restoration through your architectural i mean your artistic lens so here is what i have to say i will answer your question in two parts uh, i am not proposing restoration i am actually only documenting as it exists in this very moment and i think the restoration process is an in- incredibly interesting one because it makes the decision of which bits to keep as is in that time and allow for the deterioration versus which ones to restore and to which point because even all restoration is not necessarily restoring it to its original glory um we have just spent a week in rome it's a mind field of restoration because it restores things to various degrees of restoration and within the same building such as the pantheon 
the front and the back of the pantheon and the side of it and the other side of it are completely differently restored and it's not because they've kind of gone oh let's try restoring it in different ways that's not what's happened it's very conscious decision making on the part of the conservators to say this is what is important in this part of the building to restore versus this isn't and whether it is to restore whether it is to stop the decaying process or not stop but slow down the decaying process because restoration also includes that point where you do not necessarily bring it back to its original glory but you stop the decay process um, point in case being VT station where they are not restoring it but they are stopping the decaying process or slowing down the decaying process you know they are not kind of taking it back brick by brick they are cleaning it but they are not restore like they are not manipulating it to go back to some sort of imagined former former glory so again there you require a lot of documentation from the past to know what its former glory was like otherwise sometimes ASI you may have to see some of the ASI stuff they do fun things when they do restoration um, the other your second part um, I also feel that mechanical production of art is not necessarily taken away from art it has actually given to art uh, I think like printmaking and photography did things for the artistic both as mediums and as challenges to the art world that, are, that pro has produced some incredible like results in the last hundred years. So. Uh, hello ma'am, uh, as you said you photograph your images, uh, yeah, you photograph the uh, scenes that you've seen but in most of your drawings like the doors that I saw there were more of white, uh, use of white rather than the colors, maybe giving more color to those drawings will create more of memory in that painting. So of it's a question of as an as the person who's making the drawings it's kind of making those decisions as to where I want you to look it's it's exactly that what what is it that I want you to remember okay. what is it that I want you to look at where is it that the attention is most to be uh, because if everything I think so. I might, you know, other artists have different approaches to this, and they're all amazing approaches. But my own understanding is that, or my own limitation is that the eye can only focus on so many things at once. And this is, I find myself really, really struggling with media because of that. Because there is so much, there's so much visual information that it's kind of, I don't remember anything. So in order for me to remember something, I need to delete a lot in order to remember something. So it's kind of making that decision that I'm deleting this and I'm keeping this. And that's why, I mean, I could technically draw that entire building facade and then draw the floor as well. But I don't do that. And I don't do that because that information is something that is unimportant to me. Hi. So, uh, you said that you are very comfortable with sketchbooks and first you always uh, end up making your uh, uh, works in your sketchbooks and then also photographing them. So, I wanted to ask how uh, important is it to move from a sketchbook to a bigger medium on a paper or on a canvas? Also, how vital is it in the art world because most works that we see nowadays are not, we, we hardly see sketchbooks as in art shows. I understand that they are sketchbooks and not final works, but why can't sketchbooks 
themselves become mediums of final works so very interesting question it's a debate i've been having lately a lot with a lot of people um yes yeah, sketchbooks can be final works if you want them to be it's how you position your work for most of us and i will take pratap's help here pratap more with a wonderful wonderful pratap more the artist is here so i'll take his help here um for most of us the sketchbook is essentially the extension of what we learn to do in school or college as note keeping um it just so happens that we make our notes in writing but in drawing as well and i find that while our artist sketchbooks are incredibly interesting if you already know the artist's work they are very boring if like in the middle of some drawings you also get my shopping list like they will also say things like you know 2 kilo kanda 3 kilo tomato aadha kilo ghee you know that kind of stuff in my sketchbook so they are interesting in a retrospective situation because you you have all this work and then you have a kind of snippet of what the artist's life was like it and that comes i think comes out in the sketchbook again i'm not trying to glorify the sketchbook please don't misunderstand me i do not think that like it's this glorious treasure trove of you know it's just a notebook you keep like anybody else keeps like my nana ji used to keep a notebook as well he was a stock broker and he used to keep a notebook as well and he used to keep like rickshaw pricing inside you know every time he went he wrote down how much he paid for his rickshaw so you know are those sketchbooks as well yes they are in my opinion they very much are sketchbooks in the case of artists or architects or anybody who draws they get a slightly vis- visual element to it reason why finished works are required is because if i am to distinguish between my everyday note keeping and what i actually do or to focus my interest on to something the sketchbook is a terrible medium for that because then what the book on the other hand does something different because it edits it composes it brings together a series of thought processes in a more semblatic manner which the sketchbook doesn't do so i and i think as artwork that is very required or even for that matter for architects i mean if you went to your client and gave a sketchbook that's not going to make sense what you need to do is organize that information in order to say what you want to say at that moment in time and that's the artwork and the sketchbook is that kind of for a lack of better words a vomit of what's going on in your head at all times so i don't use a sketch a sketchbook my uh, my notebook is kind of that and all of that so uh, but yeah there are times when i uh, have to do some uh, drawings and in, into it and then it's uh, it's like just as vishwa said i'm just omitting it uh, omitting into it and then just uh, then i refer back and then choose so in anyway, a uh, for me it, it it is a complete artwork but uh, uh, it may be uh, uh, when i put it for an exhibition mission it may be independence uh, to have that all the kanda banana <laughs> so yeah uh, for an artist i think uh, it's artwork it's a complete artwork yeah, it, it can be complete artwork but, to but, say but, but i i think i will, uh, want to ask you all will you will you be able to receive that uh, if we put it <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think like the, what the artwork does is actually organizes or kind of composes the information mm-hmm. versus the sketchbook is more kind of random no it's kind of everything little bit little bit here little bit there little bit bhaji little bit italian little bit french you know it's kind of maybe maybe it's sim- similar that you have just painted the floor and not the entire door so yeah so it means it, it is but it, there is like there would be a lot more there which i'm editing out yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah.
I would simply like to ask that for you, uh, when does uh, when does drawing become art? All the time. So the drawing in the sketchbook is art. Oh yes. But then. Uh, I mean that begs the question: What is art? Of course, and that's where I'm <laughs> trying to get at, <laughs> and I'm trying to open it up to, uh, in the sense that how do you kind of place your language of work in the larger spectrum of art? how how does it become relevant today? In in terms of the way the art world deals with it, or no, in in terms of commenting on the kind of forces that shape you up. a little bit of a believer in people like uh, what's the guy who wrote Camera Lucida? Donald Barthes and um, uh, this John Berger and you know very rudimentary texts like that I kind of believe in them wholeheartedly um, where it's kind of everything everything that I am right now is a sum of everything that I've been before this. So, uh, the fact that, you know, I'm Indian, that I'm Gujarati, um, that I like Nitha Dal, which which we've just had that for lunch, which Koto doesn't like, so I'm going to bring it up, uh, that, you know, I've lived somewhere, so I, I grew up in Baroda, and then, there were XXX people in my life or that my mother was like this or you know that I had a dog or whatever my cat did something that I'm a sum of all those parts I think so and I think that like in the way that we even understand color our preferences I don't think nothing comes from nothing basically I think like everything comes from something and those that something is your circumstances your experiences your blah 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 so it's kind of again that editing process of kind of standing in the middle of this person that I am and saying well here is what I'm going to work with for now I mean before this body of work I was working with a lot of birds I worked with pigeons they were my favorite Um, but this is what I'm going to work with now and then start exploring that further and further and further and then that takes you in different trajectories because whoever knew that archi- there was another way of drawing architecture I mean I you know we learn art- architecture history in college by drawing Aya Sophia and a few other plans and that's it and you kind of know about Bauhaus and you know about a few other movements here and there you know about constructivism but you know we don't learn architecture in that way and so when I actually discovered oh there's another way it opened up these doors for me which I'd never imagined and it's kind of this process of delving deeper into what you find and then once you start digging there is no end I think for me that is the most important part of calling anything art is this kind of process of doing khujli and kind of going you know can we dig here can we dig a bit deeper if I do this a little bit more if I push this a little bit more you know what happens and that what happens is art and that it can be in any format or any uh, this uh, I'm sorry I'm asking too many questions because I don't see any hands up there okay. uh, and this question should have pro- probably come before but uh, we see very few curved lines in your works. So is it conscious? I'm learning to use French curves. <laughs> <laughs> or is the, uh, is the straight lines significant of something? I don't uh, think I've thought about it that way. I think it's just just that I'm still I mean, learning to use I mean a lot of straight lines immediately get associated to architecture. Hmm. Uh, whereas there have been a lot of architects who have never worked with straight lines. So, um. so in uh, I kind of I'm drawing what I see. Somehow, what I seem to see has very little curves. But very honestly speaking, it's not at all conscious of whether they are curved lines or straight lines. Um, it's how it comes along, and then as I learn to use more tools, uh, maybe more. Do, more. Uh, do you use tools like the architect does? Uh, in the sense that do you place the set square over the T square to make a straight line? Uh, 
No. Ah. Okay. Um, so I I have to tell you this story. You you can all like have a mighty laugh over this. Go to my partner, collaborative partner and husband. He he is an architect and he had a drafting table. Very fancy little thing, and I was damn excited by this drafting table. Right, so it was at his parents' house, and I was very insistent. He was like, "I won't use it." I was like, "Nay, nay, I will use. Bring it over." So we brought over his drafting table, and very fancy little thing. And then we had it for many months. And I, every day, I would, you know, sit on my drafting table, tilt it, adjust it to the correct thing I wanted, sit on it. Draw on it. Use the parallel to you know rest my laptop so it doesn't slip. And then one day I was drawing lines, parallel lines. And Koto came back from office, and I was like half in tears. I was like, you know, what have I done for the rest of my life? I will draw these lines. This adjusting it one mm line here, that is taking too long. I know I shouldn't have done this. And he just stood there and he started laughing and he's like, "Idiot, you're sitting on a drafting table. Just use the parallel." So I'd never used a parallel in my life before. So I was just adjusting my foot ruler like this, like this one one mm, and doing it. And he just laughed it out. He was like, "You know, you could have done this in 30 minutes." <laughs> it had taken me all day to do that much, but so I'm still learning how to use tools like architects do. I have really no idea. And sometimes I get frustrated, so I kind of discard also. I'm like, "No, no, you need to learn." So, <laughs> um, so I I was very interested in looking at uh, like your drawing series. What interested me was that uh, I would like to understand like the drawing series in which the the one that you peep from the window and you look at the other. Houses across, at like how does these drawing series start? Like I can understand like one idea starting a drawing series and then that going into those uh, print cuts with the mirror behind. At what point do you know that 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 series has ended for you? And then that goes into a final work and then presenting it into an art gallery. So uh, like where does like where do you know that the process for that one project series has ended, or to what point do you keep exploring one idea? So in terms of subject matter, I continue. So I'm still interested in windows. I'm still interested in like basically I'm a voyeuristic peeping tom, but uh, I love windows for that reason, and I kind of love the fact that they sit on thresholds and like, they are not they're not quite inside, they're not quite outside. You don't quite know what's going on with them. Um, and as a so as a subject matter, it continues. Even the party walls, they have been doing them since 2011, and I'm still doing them. Uh, in terms of the floors as well, I've been doing them since 2012, and I'm still doing them. Things get added on, things get subtracted, but as a subject matter, it kind of as a whole. I in my head, it's all one and the same thing. Um, in terms of working out series of works, it's kind of going okay. To take that mirror wala series as an example, I was really, really worried that you know, what if somebody opens the window and looks back at me? I have no reaction. Like, what do I do? Do I say hi? Do I run away? Do I come continue staring? Like, what will I do? It's a very short narrative, and it's kind of. Developing that narrative just enough to convey that much of a narrative that becomes a series, and then that series ends when the narrative ends, and, and you know it's a very small narrative, so it was only six works. On the other hand, Doughty Street kind of made the decision for me because the street has 52 doors. I like I need to draw all of them, so there's 52 draw doors here. Again, like depends on whether it's narrative or whether the site is responding and telling me, "Okay, now drawing will be done, so it will be a good series." Without it, it will be incomplete. More than it is not possible because you don't have the material.
do we have any more questions for vishwa okay thank you thank you vishwa thank, thank you so you much so for much the for being here for the thank you all for joining for the talk uh, our next ccp conversation will be held uh, two weeks down the line and keep uh, tuned to our uh, web portals for information thank you i i almost want to say this with all your beautiful thing of saying we'll do it in this side of town because people we don't always have to go to south bombay i'm like but we are in south bombay bring it to south bombay <laughs> 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 <laughs>